childhood connections. During a regression on your 2011 cruise, you led us back to a childhood memory. As you were telling us what you were going to do, I thought that I would go to a memory of when one of my little sisters was brought home from the hospital. However, I did not go there. Where I actually went was to a time when I was 4 years old, when Deborah, another sister of mine, and I got our tonsils out. We were in the hospital and were put to sleep with gas. After a few days of eating ice cream and jello, we were released. In order to leave, we needed to be wheeled out in a wheelchair. I cried and would not get in the wheelchair. My mother tried to get me in it by telling me I would be spanked when we got home. Sure enough, I was spanked. You told us to move on to the lifetime that may help with the childhood memory. I felt grey, everything was grey. I couldn't see a thing. I felt enclosed and far away from anything. I was 8 years old. We were asked to look at our feet and see what kind of shoes we had on. I had none, I was barefoot. I was being pushed in a wheelchair to my death in a gas chamber. When you asked us to see if there was anyone we recognized from this life, I didn't see any eyes, just the back of heads, and I cried. I was a very active kid, so I always wondered why the wheelchair in my childhood scared me so much. Thank you for helping me to know what had happened. I enjoyed your seminars, and in each session I was able to regress. It has changed me. I understand more of my decisions and my path. Donor after dinner we have all carried over fears, phobias, talents, affinities, and relationships from our past lives. In Donna's case, no rational reason existed for her panic attack and her reaction to the wheelchair when she was 4 years old. She had always wondered why she was so frightened. Her reaction did not fit. Once the past life linked to her gas chamber wheelchair was understood, her behavior made sense. The phobia was extinguished, and it will never return. Gail, who shared a somewhat similar past life as Donna, had severe symptoms of insomnia that completely resisted any kind of treatment. Once regressed, she found herself as a child in the concentration camps. Before being taken there, the Nazis, equipped with machine guns, had burst into her house while she was asleep. She awoke panicked and frightened, only to witness the Nazis shoot her parents. She had been killed at the children's camp as a young teenager. Gail had been serving her captors and, biting her tongue, because she had to, but when she went to her death she did so with dignity, showing no fear. Shortly after remembering this traumatic lifetime, Gail's sleep difficulty disappeared, and it has not returned. Her insomnia was resolved because she knew that the sudden and terrifying awakening by the German soldiers was from her past life, not her present one. The initial or root cause of her issue was brought to consciousness, the past life wound was healed. Gail can now speak her mind, her truth, without having to bite her tongue or hold back for fear of severe consequences. This also is of the past. Now she is free. The author of the following story had to learn these lessons about holding back and standing up to those in power. She, too, once enslaved, is now free. Dot. Overcoming enslavement. How could that be me? I asked myself. The woman that I was studying was someone whom I would never recognize as myself. Her body was deathly thin and wrinkled. She wore a burlap-type tunic that was held on her rat like frame with a rope at the waist. She looked 80 years old but was probably only in her 40s. In contrast to her abject poverty, she wore a valuable gold ring with a deep blue, moon-shaped stone, about the size of a nickel. I had started this life as a young, beautiful, strawberry blonde girl. Only the harshest of lives and isolation could have caused this much change in one lifetime. She loved to ride horses through the countryside and gardens. Because her mother was deceased and her father was unavailable to her, she rode freely too freely. She was ignorant of the bands of men who roamed purposefully to conquer. The town dictator, a young man himself, had her kidnapped. Her horse was brutally killed. Her world changed permanently overnight. David was the kidnapper, a man of influence in her town. After impregnating her, he had a wedding ceremony performed by the local clergy. Other men gathered around the couple to witness and guard them from onlookers who might interfere. The baby was taken from her at birth. The woman was imprisoned until she became too unhealthy and undesirable to entice companionship, at which point she was threatened and beaten. Her life of enslavement to David was symbolized by her blue stone ring, which everyone who was connected to him was required to wear. 
she became his delivery woman. She transported valuable items, but she had become such an outcast in the community that no one would interfere with her deliveries. She might as well have been a leper. The townspeople always her deliveries. She might as well have been a leper. The townspeople always made a point to ridicule and mock her poverty and enslavement. She was glad to be left alone in her hut on the outskirts of David's property. It ensured a respite from the societal degradation and, worst of all, the constant threats of physical injury. Although her hut barely protected her fire pit from the extinguishing cold winds and mist, the fire was a greatly appreciated luxury to her starving body. The most difficult of her tasks was going to retrieve from David the items she was to deliver. She had to pass by animal pens that housed small creatures who were used for torture. She saw them suffering from beatings and painful amputations. Worst of all was seeing the suffering but no longer having the feelings of empathy that would motivate her to release them. Her own suffering had dehumanized her to a state of dull existence. Upon entry into the dictator's chambers, she showed her blue stone ring. She kneeled, expecting ridicule and abuse. It was common and inescapable. None of the abuse and horror affected her anymore. Her life was truly that of a victim. There were no choices or escapes unless she was to fight back, which would lead to death. In the last moments of her life, I saw her squatting in front of a fire in her hut, the first one in many days. I could see and feel that her kidneys and other organs had begun to shut down due to starvation. She fell over next to the fire, and her heart stopped beating. It was a pathetic, unrewarding, invisible way to die. As I left that body, I could see the mental enslavement that this body had contained. I had believed that it was better to do the work of evil than to fight back. I learned that fighting back and dying would have been better than living enslaved. Furthermore, complying with the dictator had caused him to become more entrenched in his power. I had nothing to lose by fighting back. I was going to die either way. The familiar characters from that life in my present one were my mother, who died when I was 19 and entering the adult world, and my father, who was emotionally unavailable and detached throughout most of my childhood. The dictator was my second husband, who was emotionally and physically abusive for the six months that my daughter and I lived with him. The lessons I learned in that lifetime were that it was okay to be young and beautiful. Young people need support, guidance, and possibly protection as they face the adult world. I learned that it was better to fight back than to live in enslavement. Compliance is a slow death. The things I brought to this lifetime are a deep love and empathy for the things I brought to this lifetime are a deep love and empathy for animals and for those marginalized by society. I spent 25 years of my life working as an advocate for abused and disabled children. I brought a deep bond and protection for my daughter, my one and only child. I appreciate the choice to leave enslaving situations, and I exercise compassion for all, knowing that we are all shaped by our experiences, both past and present. Alice the deaths accruing from Alice's past life will be an obligation to David and his cohorts. To abuse, torture, and humiliate or kill animals and humans creates karma that must be resolved. They will have to make it up to Alice and the others. Our lessons are of compassion and kindness, not hatred and violence. We are, in reality, spiritual beings. It is never too late to reorient yourself to your spiritual or destined path and to learn these lessons afresh. Wherever you are now is simply a point in time, and the future is multifaceted, changing and growing as you do. No matter how we may have acted in the past, every moment presents another opportunity to treat one another with care and consideration. Even David, at the height of his tyrannical reign, could have decided to become a kinder person, to open his heart, to increase his understanding, to choose love. These are all things that we know so well yet don't always put into practice. A person who acts out of ego or strictly from intellect can wander very far from his path, but a person who acts from the heart cannot, for the heart will always pull him back. Listen to your intuition, for that is the open heart at work. Choose the loving path, it will never lead you astray. The most difficult lifetimes often provide the opportunity for accelerated spiritual growth. Such lifetimes do not automatically imply negative karma from the past. Perhaps you chose the difficult life so that you could progress the most. Alice's existence as the delivery woman was very hard and heavy, but she learned invaluable wisdom and, in her present incarnation, she is manifesting great empathy, compassion, and loving service. 
The most beautiful flowers often arise from seeds hidden and nurtured by the cold, wet mud. During a recent five-day workshop, an attendee named Stacy told me that her breathing was becoming more labored, even though she had not yet experienced any past life or childhood memories. She thought that pollens or other antigens might have been in the air, for grass, flowers, and trees were blooming in the early summer warmth of the New York Hudson Valley, where the intensive workshop was taking place. She also told me that she had a history of asthma. I suspected that other factors might have been at work, and so I chose to regress her in front of the group. I picked a volunteer to hold a microphone close to Stacy's mouth so that the group could hear any words that she spoke during the regression. Another group member, a surgeon from Alabama, was hunched forward in his seat as I began the hypnotic process. At the time, I did not know that my, randomly, chosen microphone holder, sitting right next to Stacy, was a speech therapist and an expert in respiratory conditions. Stacy's first memory was of choking on a slice of apple when she was a young girl. She had panicked at the time, but her mother's response was to give her, bread balls, to help ease the apple down to her stomach. This failed to help and perhaps exacerbated the situation. The little girl couldn't breathe, and she became even more terrified. Finally, her mother held her upside down by the ankles and firmly backed her on the back, dislodging the apple slice. I asked Stacy how she had felt just before the apple popped out from her throat. Frightened to death, she responded. This phrase became the bridge that I used to uncover her past life. When were you, frightened to death, before? I asked. Her answer quickly followed. She had been an 11-year-old boy who had fallen from a rowboat into a lake. The currents carried the boat away from him, and they carried him farther and farther from the shore. He finally became too fatigued to swim any longer. Nobody was around to hear his cries for help. He drowned, gasping and swallowing the lake's water. Stacy's breathing was raspy and rapid, but when the boy's consciousness floated above his body and above the lake in the clouds, it completely changed. She could inhale so freely and deeply now, with no difficulty at all. As I awakened her, her breathing remained relaxed, and it continued to be so even as the audience asked her questions about her experiences as the choking girl and the drowning boy. She had a strong feeling that her respiratory problems would not resurface. The microphone holding speech therapist had also noticed the remarkable changes. Clavicular breathing, she had observed, had become diaphragmatic. The surgeon agreed. Past life outcomes shed light on present-day phobias and conditions. Once those are remembered, similar situations will never frighten you to death anymore. Renata's story, soulmate this is a part of Zindagi Ki Roshni Consultancy. It has been established for those who have lost someone and for those who are very sad in their life. About 100 PDF books and 20 short audio books of this topic will be sent to those who join it. This data will be sent to their email or WhatsApp. If you want to join this organization then please send WhatsApp message to this number.